Uh, welcome to our fourth and last workshop of Game Credit 2014. Uh, I'm Joe. I'm the organizer, one of the organizers of this competition. Uh, it's it, it's only one week left of the competition. I hope everyone is doing well and and are are uh, getting ready to turn something in. Uh, for a reminder, the deadline is 16th of February, uh, 235959. Uh, so uh, we haven't really finalized uh, details on how to turn a project in. Uh, we're working on that. The details of that will be on gamecreator.igi.is but most probably it will be uh, th through Dropbox. So you put your file on a Dropbox and email us a link to the file. Uh, this has been used in more competitions and rather successfully and, and is quite popular. Uh, for today, we have Olo Orante, who's going to talk about uh, a bit about marketing and uh, the, how to apply for a Nordic Game Dev Grant, which is a, a really good uh, project or program to to seek funds in. Uh, so let's have Olorante come up and, and talk to us about that. All right. Okay. Thank you. So thanks everybody for showing up. Uh, it's not the most exciting workshop of them all because you know after game design you know now now is the boring part however this is the important part because um, we all need funds and we all need to market our stuff and that's what I'm going to talk about today So um, I'm going to talk about three things. Uh, IGI, I'm, I'm just briefly going to talk about IGI, just to um, uh, so everybody knows what that is. I'm on the board of the IGI. IGI is the Icelandic gaming industry uh, trade organization for, for the industry. I'm going to talk about the dev grant, which is uh, one way to get funds. Uh, and then, then I'm going to talk about marketing or a little bit brief thing about marketing. I'm not a marketing expert, but, but I know a few things about marketing. Uh, I work for Battler, which is a gaming company, but it's very far from the gaming companies you would probably imagine as a gaming company because we create platforms and lottery games, betting and gambling and that stuff. And we have a platform, that's our main product, and, and through this uh, a lot of money flows. So uh, it's more in financial, but then we have all the front end, like games, lottery games, sports betting games, uh, instant ticket games, and so on. Uh, and the marketing, the way we do marketing is uh, through huge budgets. So we have a lot of money to spend on marketing, and we go to trade shows and, 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 so, and so on. So it's very different than indie marketing. So I'm gonna talk about these three things. I'm gonna start with IGI, <clears throat> and the IGI, uh, is association of uh, a few companies um, like uh, my company Betware, uh, and here here you see some of the uh, members. There are not that many members. Uh, we are hoping that we will get more because this is a really good network to be in. So if you uh, are creating a company, uh, joining this organization is a very good move because you get access to all the people, the network, and everything. And I think the requirement to join is to be in the uh, Federation of Icelandic Industries, and they have a. It costs money, but it's a very low. It's a very. The amount is not that high uh, for for small companies. But then the big companies they pay more. Um, 
Now, it was, the, the association was founded in, in 2009, so five years since. Uh, and the, if, we, if you look at the employees of this, you have 620. Th that's the number. We, we don't know, but that's the number we calculated last, you know, on, a, on the back of an envelope. Um, probably 400 or so work for the work for CCP. And uh, uh, for, no, sorry, 400 of these work for uh, Icelandic companies. Most of them work for CCP. That's what I was going to say. Uh, and um, the turnover is, uh, you know, if you compare this to other regions, it's not much, but uh, I think it's a decent amount. If, and if you break this down, most of the revenues uh, turnover comes from CCP, you know, probably 90%, and then the rest comes from 90% better, and then it sort of trails off. You know, I don't know the number, but that's the feeling we get sometimes. Okay, so what do we do? First of all, we have meetups, and this is an excellent way for uh, startups, indie developers, people that want to get into the business, love doing games, have great, con great game concepts, want to meet people. So come to these meetups. They're usually held Wednesdays, I think, in some bar. You know, we've been using Kex for the last few events. There is one coming up. Uh, and it, it, it usually is really entertaining, uh, interesting, knowledgeable, and uh, you meet a lot of people. And if you're so, so inclined, you can have beer while you're uh, watching this. So um, then we have the game creator. That's one of the, another thing that we do. Uh, I don't need to talk about that. Uh, but we also work a lot with uh, education, university schools, uh, and so on. And for example, we have, um, we have uh, worked with Reykjavik University to create this uh, program, so you can go into game design program, uh, and uh, we even have a faculty position in interactive storytelling and game design. That's David too. he's uh, in this position. And we're very happy. This is a position that was uh, that CCP is funding for us, and uh, that, that was a, a really nice move. Uh, and we also worked with uh, the lower education, also the the the, the schools, the compulsory schools, uh, if some opportunity come up. So we try to work with anybody in education. Uh, and. Then the Nordic game cooperation, that's really important to us because Nordic region is our market and this is the easiest way. So if you want to go into the indie business, work with the Nordic. I mean, it's the hottest area to be in right now in gaming. It's the Nordic region. And we want to be part of the Nordic region. Uh, and uh, every year uh, since I think it's the 10th anniversary, there's this conference uh, called Nordic Game. This is uh, a picture. This is our booth a few years ago. Um, Promote Iceland or Island Stova, they helped us uh, fund this booth and they, they took care of everything. There were like 12 companies one year, eight companies the next year, and then sort of uh, we couldn't fund this or we couldn't find people to go anymore. But uh, it's very useful to get network connections, to meet people, and it's it's probably the best conference you can you can get for your money because it's really good value because the quality of the speakers is very high and um, it's really good access to the network through ITI and just to go there uh, and it's probably the least it's probably the least expensive to attend because you can fly to Copenhagen it's used to, it's in Malmo so you fly to Copenhagen uh, and take the train over to Malmo and if you want the next conference is in May, so if you want to go there, uh, you should try to find hotels. Uh, it gets difficult when you when when you, when it's uh, close to the conference. And then and then um, uh, wasn't it last year? When was the song contest in in uh, Malmo? Was it last year? Yeah, and 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 it was at the same time as the conference, and the conference had to move. <laughs> Uh, because of the song contest, it was people thought it was uh, you know more important. And we have our own conference. Uh, we have had this conference, the future is bright, uh, and it's always bright. 
And the last one was in, in March uh, 2012. We, have, we are planning a new one, uh, the next one in this fall, this year. Now, the strategy of the ITI, ITI is a voluntary uh, organization, so there's no staff. Uh, and the thing that we managed to do is because of volunteers, like Yoe is helping to organize this. Nobody gets paid for anything. It's just people working, uh, giving their time, effort, and energy uh, to this. So the amount of work that IGI does depends on the volunteers, how willing they are to donate some time and effort into this. But we have a strategy, um, uh, and the strategy, uh, this is my version. Uh, I didn't look up the official strategy. Uh, it's the work environment. We want to have living condition in Iceland where we can keep our developers. Uh, and that means that get rid of these stupid con currency, currency controls and things like this. We want to have good living standards. Uh, we want to have quality of life in Iceland. Just and, and, and be, to be able to live, get loans on, on decent price, and so on. We want to have the same living standard as our competitors in Sweden, Finland, because they are taking some of our, our developers. We want to take theirs back instead. So we want to have good work environment uh, and a good condition to run business. Financing is also one thing that we are really you know, interested in, to get funding promote funding, get investors into the region to, to get, uh, connect the developers and the, 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 uh, the capital. And uh, it has been over the last few years uh, a little bit difficult, but we are hoping that this gets easier. It's, uh, the game development is, is you know, a pretty risky business so, so, uh, because it's so hit driven. I'll talk about that later. And the third thing, uh, we emphasize the Nordic cooperation. So, I mean, we are tailing those guys. We, we, we want to be in the, in, 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 with, with those. And uh, their trade organizations are, are much bigger, and uh, we enjoy uh, the benefit of working with them. So this is the Icelandic game industry. At this point, are there any questions? Okay, a anytime, just let me know. Okay, so second thing I want to talk about is Nordic Games Dev Grant. And so, um, if you look at the Nordic region, uh, the Nordic, uh, this is, uh, has been for decades uh, uh, much emphasized by all these countries. So Nordic cooperation is, uh, goes back so, some time. And uh, it is th those countries, uh, Iceland, Norway, Sweden, Finland, and then so, some regions like Greenland, Faroe Islands, and Åland Islands. And uh, uh, this is, uh, th there's a lot of comp cooperation between those countries. Uh, and one for a few, uh, few years ago, the, the uh, Council of Ministers for, that oversee this, this cooperation they decided to put some effort into gaming. And this is the mission. The mission of the Nordic Game Program is to ensure access to quality Nordic computer games for children and young people. So keep this in mind. This is important. Um, so the Nordic Council of Ministers decided in 2005 or something to fund this program for five years. And they put a lot of money into this. And uh, it was supposed to run for five years, and then it should be finished. But uh, we managed to get this uh, extended, uh, but the funds coming into this, they're a little bit less. And the reason was that we will fund this for five years. This will create an industry, and then the industry can take care of itself. We don't need to fund business, because business should find its own way. You know, it doesn't need government support, but it needs government support to get kick-started. Let's do that. And I think this program has been very successful to do that. And now it's sort of sunsetting. And maybe we need to extend it or lobby for extension furthermore, but uh, we will see. But the program is still running, and, but it's on a smaller scale. So the program is operated by Nordic Game Institute. Nordic Game Institute is a, the organization 
of the five countries. IGI is a member of Nordic Game Institute. We have you know, our representative on the board of NGI. And NGI uh, operates this program and a company, a company called Nordic Game Resources, which is just a business uh, uh, with lots of really clever people that know how to run programs like this, conferences, trade shows, and all of these things. Uh, and together, these bodies, they are running the program today. The Nordic Game Institute uh, was founded here in Reykjavik, uh, I think it was last year or, or the year before. It's very recent, and uh, uh, we had a celebration here in, in, in Reykjavik when we founded this. So what does the Nordic Game program do? Oh, basically, there are three things. Export missions, conference, and dev grants. And I'm going to spend most time talking about dev grants because that's important to you. So the export mission is going to conference like uh, San Francisco, GTC, which is a really huge conference um, in, in San Francisco, uh, Game Connection in Leipzig, and there are more of these. And, and Nordic Game uh, program will have a booth, and you can apply to be part of that booth. So it will be sort of a Nordic uh, booth, and they will fund it. Uh, we have not, the Icelandic companies have not usually gone and done this. CHP has gone to, goes to all these shows, they have their own booth, uh, but the smaller companies, they usually can't afford to go this, there. But uh, what, one of the things that we would like to do is to help and assist those that apply. Uh, that's some, some of the ideas that we have been talking about. Okay, the second thing was the game conference, and I really recommend this because, as I said earlier, this is the easiest way to get into the, into the community. Uh, see what's going on. There are high-quality speakers, uh, lots of parties, uh, and good way to get to know people. And everybody is very open. If you come and you ask them, you know, I have this problem, can you help me? They will give you information about this. Very open, uh, a lot of sharing going on. And that's sort of the feeling you get when you're in this Nordic uh, community, that people are friends. They might may fight for the developers, but they're friends uh, and share a lot. Because the market, I mean, we, Icelandic, Icelandic people, we think we are small, but the Nordic region as a general thinks it's small. So uh, the market is out there. Okay, I'm gonna spend some time talking about uh, development fund. So total of uh, three million Danish crowns, uh, will be granted to development studios in two, 2014. Um, this hasn't been, you know, there was a board meeting of NGI last week and uh, it was uh, decided that it would be the same as last year, but I haven't seen any, any the information is not on the, on the website yet. And the deadline is very likely to be uh, uh, early April. It was 2nd of April last year. So this is a way, if you have a game and you want to get money to pay for the development of this game, to pay yourself salaries and pay the staff some salaries, uh, just to get this game from the concept stage to a production stage, uh, and you need money, and this is one way to get the money. You apply for a grant to the Nordic Game Program uh, to fund it. And here are the guidelines, and the, these, are the, these are the guidelines that were last year, uh, and uh, I think, uh, to my knowledge, it's the same guidelines. But I have to have you know, a disclaimer on this, because I don't know. They might change something. So the following criteria apply regarding project. Support, amount, and payment. So let's go through these guidelines. Selection criteria and process will be clearly communicated to our applicants. Uh, and all of this is in, on the, on the homepage, webpage of Nordic Game Program. Maximum support of 6, 600,000 Danish crowns and minimum of 100,000. So you can apply for 600. Uh, and you have to calculate how much that is in Icelandic. Uh, support cannot exceed 75% of the project budget. So you have to do something, you have to fund something yourself. 
Uh, and uh, only one project per applicant can be funded. And this is supposed to be 2013. Now, Ford got to change in all places. Um, this is from last year. And uh, repayment of support fund can be required if support contract or conditions are violated. So there are some rules to this. And to apply, you have to have some, I mean, there are some uh, requirements that you need to meet. It has to be a Nordic company. It has to be a computer game development company, independent, not owned by a game publisher or some non-Nordic game developer. It has to own the IP rights and can guarantee that the completed project will be released in at least one Nordic language. So it has to be not in English only, it has to be in a Nordic language. Remember where the money comes from. Remember the mission in the beginning. It's to promote games. And the danger was that all of these American games are coming in. <laughs> I imagine they would have said something like that. So we need games for the region. So it, uh, it's understandable that it is in. This is a requirement. OK, and I'm just reading the, the, what says on the homepage. Project is not already approved for production. Um, development company is financially stable, not in bankruptcy or liquid, liquidity crisis. So it must be a valid company. Support application uh, has been submitted complete by the due date. So practicalities. And I added this new rules because this was decided on the board me meeting that it must be a registered company. And it's only because this was a case where one applicant was not a registered company. And so they put this rule in. And here's the criteria for development support. And this is what the experts, so, so who, what, who are the people that decide which projects get funded and which are not funded? Well, that's a group of experts. And these experts are, they're called experts, and these experts are appointed by the ministry. So the Ministry of Education will appoint somebody to be on a council that will be called the, uh, the computer, the, the Nordic Game Computer Program Experts. And they will go over all the applications and decide who will get the grant. These people rule, not NGI, and not the Nordic Game resources that operates the program. They will just execute it. The experts decide. And uh, this is the, what they have in mind when they go. Project appropriateness for target group, especially concerning age. So uh, we will go through this. Uh, development company and team's documented experience. Uh, and uh, I will show you the application. Importance of development support to the project's launch. Uh, and uh, innovation, how innovative it is. This is very important. If it's the same boring game that you can buy out there, um, it's um, probably not going to get funded. Number of Nordic languages the f finished game, the finished game will be released in. And the project artistic ambitions. So this is what the experts are supposed to have in mind when they select something. And there are some of these are very uh, important. For example, the number of languages. Uh, if it's only one, uh, and the next game has three or four, and you have to choose between them, that's the thing that the experts will look at. And the artistic ambition, you know, it's maybe not be the important, but it is still very important because when you look at the application, uh, the first impression is so, I mean, if you see the art and if it doesn't, you know, if it doesn't look good, it will have impact on the application. So let's look at the application itself. And I'm going to sit down now. Okay, so one of the nicest things about this program, if you apply for a grant, you have to fill in a very complicated form. But the, the CEO of Nordic Game Resources, his name is Eric Robertson, he, he, he explained once, you know, game developers, 
they're creative people, highly skilled. They don't like filling in forms. They like programming, making art, gameplay, game design. They hate this stuff. You can't get them to do this. It has to be simple. So they made it simple. So this is one of the simplest application forms you can find. If you think it's complicated, trust me, there are others out there that you would hate. So let's go through this. Project title, uh, that's very sim simple, the firm. And this is the thing that is actually, you know, a, a lot of applications, and I know, I'm one of the experts. I forgot to tell you that. This here, this is the first thing the experts see. They will look at this and this will give the impression. If it's not cool, if it's boring or, you know, doesn't, it has to be wow. Don't go over the top, but it has to be artistically really sophisticated. So you see this, first impression. And this is just, I, 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 because I've been evaluating these. I, I talk from experience, because, because if it doesn't feel good, uh, it will judge the way you will go through the application. It shouldn't do that, but this is the way brain works. If it's, it's a wow, well, then you will look differently. But then you go through all the numbers that follow, and they have a lot to say. But if, it's a, if they check out, this is, this, is, this is the first impression. It's very important to uh, don't dismiss this. So if you're filling this out, don't put a crappy picture there. It has to be something that is cool. And then there's some uh, details. And then there's uh, information like uh, what you're applying for, the, t the title of this, uh, target groups, platforms, everything. So it's not that complicated to fill out. And here's the, this is just some, you know, technical details, no problem. Uh, here are the uh, languages uh, and some questions to answer. And also this is the, uh, yeah, example of finished published games. This will, all, if this is impressive, uh, it will tell the experts, yeah, the, 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 these guys know how to do it. This. These people, they know how to do, do this. But for, start, for those that are starting, maybe they don't have. But if there's anything, you know, even a, even a small project, uh, anything, you know, it's good to have that. And then this is the uh, people uh, that are working on the project. Uh, and, and, and any experience that can be put there is good, just anything. The more, the better. So the experts are checking, is this, am I comfortable with a, giving grant to this person? Will this person do the job? Can I rely on that? Because we want this dev grant to be successful. And everything that's funded, we want it to be a game that's published. So uh, and then there's the, uh, uh, what was this? Applicant independent, organization ownership, yeah, some technical details, uh, markets and potential. And this is, yeah, unique selling position. And please position your game in relation to existing competitors. So this is something that, this is very important. You have to say, why is this game different than anybody else's game? Uh, we believe that this is a unique concept because of this. Nobody's tried this. This is, and it's very important to re relate to other things. So this game is similar to this, but we have added this thing here from that game. So it's, it's kind of like this crossing this. Very easy to understand if you if you can relate to other things. But the unique selling position, uh, geographic, uh, described marketing distribution and business model, you know. People often, you know, don't put emphasis on this. This is maybe not the, you know, the sexiest thing about being a game developer is about marketing and these things, business models, you know. But you have to put 
in a believable thing. How are you going to do marketing? Well, we're going to use social media. Eh? What does that mean? You're going to post something on Facebook? That's not going to dent anybody. Nobody's going to trip over that. So it has to be believable. And if you have some social media strategy, you have to describe it as you know what you're talking about. I have a strategy. We will create campaigns. Uh, we will do this and that. And it has to be believable. And the business model also has to be believable. Oh, we're just going to you know, give it to free. No, you're not. It has to be maybe free to play, in-app purchases, downloads, 4.99 in downloads. Whatever it is, it has to be described there. And how are you going to do It might be Steam, App Store, whatever the means of distribution, put it there. But make, it, make the business model and the marketing uh, believable. I mean, for your own sake, <laughs> it has to be. I mean, but don't just say, I'm going to use social media, and this will go madly viral, and everybody will buy this game. No, they're not. Greatest risk. Um, people usually say, ah, oh, we don't get any funds. And that's probably the case. But you have to think about the, uh, what the risks are. Um, what else? Yeah, some business um, cost breakdown. And, the, and, and you have to uh, think about the salaries of the people. I mean, even if, you, if, if people are not taking very high salary, you have to put in, we're going to pay the team this amount of money for this amount of months, and this is the cost. So you put that in, and you pay yourself the salary. And... Yeah, this is the languages. Yeah, the other thing was where are you from. Uh, so, the more the better. If it's one, mm -hmm. the more the better. I mean, how hard is it is to uh, translate this. Uh, at least have uh, Danish. Maybe not Finnish. That's a little bit difficult uh, for Icelandic people. And but the other languages should be easy. Uh, and I think that the, I just wanted to go briefly through this uh, without going into to any details on this. So, any questions on this? Uh, where, where would I go about and um, find this application? Okay, where do you get this? This is on the Nordic Game program. Uh, so they have a website. Yeah, 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 yeah. We, we can look at that. So Nordic Game Program, that's a, that's a program. And here's all the uh, detail, lots of information in here. Funding for games. Uh, here's the document that I was showing you. This is the deadline for last year. They need to update this. I expect that they will update this in the next few weeks. And these are the things that I took, you know, I, I, I put this in my, my slides. This is what I've been talking about. And this is the expert group. Um, and any technical details. So everything's there. And Hold on, yeah. they used to have a policy about not supporting educational games. Is that still the case? No. The question is they used to have policy not supporting educational games. I think it's exactly the opposite. Uh, you know, I, I would have to look at that. But last year uh, or maybe the year before, the emphasis was on we need to, and the ministers specifically asked for this, and they would they said you know we would favor uh, games to be more educational 
in the mission of the program. That's the mission, the original mission of the program. So any educational additions to the game uh, is something that the experts are required to look at and say, you know, this fits. So it's favor. It's looked at favorably. If it wasn't before, I'm surprised if that was the case. Uh, it is. It may, I, I don't know what type of educational games, but that's the mission. Well, that, that's one of the things that they emphasized today. Okay, so th this was the application. I, I wanna, you know, I wanna get more applications from Iceland. And for the last couple of years, no grant has come to Iceland. I am not allowed, as an expert member, to have anything to say on Icelandic applications. So I can't lob, and this is very strict. If I know anybody that is applying, I will leave the room. That's the rules, and it's very formal, very strict, and we honor the code, we honor the, the, the guidelines that are set to us. So if I know anybody, I will have to leave. Anybody that has some, knows somebody, they, they have to leave the meeting, while the others will discuss if this is going to be granted. So I have not anything to say to the Icelandic uh, applications. However, I can uh, talk about the important stuff about applying. Uh, <clears throat> so, but if you think about it, you have to follow the rules. There are lots of applications. So if, imagine, here's, uh, here are the experts. They have 160 applications to go through, and they have a week. Well, actually, each one of the experts will get like uh, 30 or 40 or something to go through in detail. They will be the experts on this, but then we will read all the rest so we can talk about them. Even, even in, in the Icelandic, you know, I would probably skip them. I don't have to read them, but I do because I want to know what people are doing. Um, so when you have all these applications, uh, one way to go through them is to dismiss those that are not qualified. You know, this one doesn't follow the rule. And this is very strict. And if you don't, come, if you don't fill out the form, there's a missing box. There's a box empty. Dismissed. Sorry. So don't forget, don't get rejected because of this. Also, so game developers, they have huge knowledge of what they're thinking about. They're thinking about it all the time. They're, they're working with this game in their mind. And when they describe it, it becomes very technical because they have so much knowledge and they have so much detail to say. But to read that, it might be pretty difficult. So uh, describe the game so anyone can understand and relate to known concept. Oh, this game is very much like the other game that came out here. It was very popular, but we're doing this. So it's uh, this game with social elements. That's easy. And then you describe. So let's listen to Einstein. And also one thing, uh, I forgot to put that in the slides the application in English. That's not a problem for the Icelandic applications because they're all in English. And, uh, but for the Swedes and Norwegians, they usually put them in their own language or, or Sweden. There are two official languages, English and Swedish. And uh, it is, I mean, the experts are required to know Swedish. So I will read the Swedish application. And I try not to judge them too hard uh, because I have difficulties understanding the language. I have to look a lot of things up. So it can be frustrating. Uh, I try not to have it frustrating, so I will be fair. But there's something in the back of the mind that will say, you know, but of course we are not supposed to do that. But keep that in mind. That um, I mean, nobody's going to write in Swedish here, so it's not... Mute point. <laughs> uh, Make sure you understand the priorities of the grant. I mean, uh, creating a really nasty, dirty game would probably not go there. If it's also if it's very sexist, if it's very male-oriented, sexist kind of a game, it goes out. You know, the, the experts have to be politically correct, if I can say so. 
we have to think about, you know, is this suitable for everybody? Is this just a niche market? Or just sexist games? They, I mean, they don't get anywhere. So you have to understand the priorities and the spirit of the, the mission. Be innovative. You don't, and you know, we don't need another racing game for boys. Even if you want to make a game like that. <laughs> uh, and so if it's a common game that, you know, ah, oh, just another one. So it's nothing new, it doesn't add anything. It's not going to change the world in a bit. It's just going to be yet another. So that is not probably going to go very far. So innovative, new concepts. Uh, some, and, and these experts, they, I mean, they know games. They, they, they see innovative things. Uh, I mean, if they're there, they, they will see it. And they say, this is cool. This is something I haven't seen. Cool. But you know, you don't have to go wild, but uh, don't get in, in locked in some old stuff. And also, don't be uh, afraid to apply for risky concepts. I mean, you don't have to go wild, but you can look at to you can uh, if it's if it's a good concept, you know, apply for that. And also. Don't be naive in, this, in, in the way, you know, I see a lot of applications where, where the, the game is, you know, it, it looks like a game that a couple of guys came up with because they love to play this kind of game. But it, it's not a good idea. So you have to think not about yourself. So many of the applications, they're making games for themselves. I mean, that's a cool thing. If it's a cool game, <laughs> if it's a good game. But if it's a game that, mm, even if they would like it, so uh, the experts will look, ah, oh, yeah, this is a, a good thing. And uh, so if it's not a, so it may be a game that you want to play, but uh, still doesn't make it a good game. And think about the market segments there are. Are under that are under targeted, yeah. There, there are some, you know, the, the the most popular group is boys. Uh, in some age group. Or men in some age group, because for some reason we think only males play game, but that's wrong. The biggest segment of gameplay in the last uh, three years has been kids, two to five, one to five. That's the biggest growth in gaming over the last few years. Well, that's because of the iPad and tablets in general. Before that, it was women in the age group 45 to 55. Facebook, Farmville. And if you would ask them, I mean, they're not playing computer games, they're just on Facebook. <laughs> and, but there are other groups than these that uh, the usual what we think. So think about, and one of the things, uh, what about girls, teenage girls? They like to play games, but they probably <laughs> play different games than boys. So just keep in mind there are other game segments, market segments out there uh, that are under-targeted, that people are not creating enough games for. And also, the first impressions were art sketches, flowchart, concept images. Uh, this is very important. I mean, everything in this is important, but this will give the impression. How do I feel about this application? Well, the art is great. The business concept is okay. Marketing seems reasonable. This is a good application. Uh, and the last point I want to make, I don't have a slide to read. The quality of the application. You have to have quality. You have to put time into this. Even if you don't like Word. I mean, who, who likes Word? Anyway, don't like to spend time working on documents like this. But you can see there are different countries. They have different quality standards of applications. Iceland has not been successful. We need to raise the quality. So any amount of hours you spend on this is good. Even if you don't get a grant, 
having all this information is very useful just to describe the game, to use in pitches, presentations. This is good stuff. This is good information that is there. Okay, so this is the last thing I want to say about any questions at this point? Okay, uh, now I'm going to go on on the thin ice. <laughs> In my world, marketing is huge budget, um, booths at conferences, and so on, dining and whining people. Uh, uh, but I've been particip participating in startups as you know, advisor, board member, so I know how they think. Um, so the game development is the easy part. Uh, getting, getting players is hard. It's not as easy as people think. You know, I just put it on online, and people will come. No, they will not. They will not come. You have to get them. And you have to get them to pay. That's even more hard. You have to separate them and their money. And to do that, you have to give value instead. You have to give them something they want to pay for. It has to be value. And maybe you have to give a lot of stuff before they see the value. So maybe you have to allow them to take the game, play the game, and then you will monetize it at later stage. Maybe you can only monetize like 5% of the, 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 the people that use it. Maybe that's enough. And some of the games, they have these, well, we talk about the, the, the 1990 rule in, in, in games that have lots of players free to play. Uh, can I? So, so, so I mentioned, you know, the, in, in Iceland, the, there's uh, very few company. well, actually one company that's huge, uh, another company that is uh, smaller, and then the, the most of them are here. So this is a, a famous power law that appears again and again and again, and it appears here also. So 1% of the game players, if you have a free-to-play game, uh, they will buy anything and they will spend a lot of money. So these are the rules of thumbs. 9% uh, are the base that you can rely on. Because these 1%, they're usually crazy people. I mean, not in a bad way, but they just get so into the game, they want to buy everything. And we've seen this in, in many projects. I've seen this in many projects. There are some people that just, you know, if something, if you could buy something in this virtual world, they would buy it. And they would spend money real money. And then you have uh, the 9%, which is a solid, rock solid, steady flow of income. Loyal people that will play the game, they enjoy the game, and they, these, are the, these are the guys that you need to, that you need to uh, emphasize, because they will, they will broadcast to their friends. They will get their friends to play. And these, these are the sort of the visionaries of the game. These are the important people. But you have to remember, these are the free-to-play players. But you have to remember that the free-to-play, even if they don't pay anything, they are your friend. They are very important to you because they create the player base. They are the guys and girls that come and people play with. They are in the world. And even if they don't buy anything, they don't pay anything, you have to have them. So all of these are important. And uh, the visionaries, the, the, the people that, the, these are the people that will tell anybody else. These, the 90%, they're not that hooked up to, they like the game, they want to play, but they would probably not be the ones that post on Facebook what a great game it is. Okay, so how do you do marketing? Well, basically there are two ways to do this. One is to sign up with, um, publisher and the other one to go the indie way and if we if we uh, go the pub I'm not going to talk about publishing uh, but if if you find the publisher um, if you find the game is sort of like you know you you're lucky if you find the publisher somebody that wants to find your that, that want to fund your game fund everything and do the marketing and so on 
Uh, that's sort of how it works. But uh, you really have to be careful of selecting the publishers. And uh, I didn't have any any list. I was focusing sort of on the indie thing. Uh, but you have to have some reliable publishers that will do the marketing and do the PR and do all, all, all these things. Has the marketing budget. They will get a share of the revenues down the line. And they will fund the, the publicity, the PR, and they will get a share until, so they get their money back. But many of the publishers, they, they, I mean, because this is a hit-driven business, and what they will do, they will put a clause in, in the contract and saying that, you know, if something happens, if you don't meet some deadlines, uh, they, they, they don't need to honor the contract. And so, so there are lots of variation of this, of course. But we have seen examples where the publisher comes in, does a test round, uh, funds advertisement campaign, and if the traction is not good enough, they will just leave it and go to the next one. Because they have like hundreds of games, only a few of them will work and give them lots of money, but they know that the rest is not going to work, so, so they just cancel it. So this didn't work, okay, the next one. So you have to be uh, selective, even if it's a luxury to have a publisher. Sometimes uh, you have to find somebody you uh, can trust. Okay, the indie game. Now it gets complicated, but this is much more fun, I think. Um, and uh, I mean, I'm sort of visioning myself that small game studio, startup, has a great game concepts, got some dev grants or funding this. How do you get this to the market? How do you get this out there and get the users to start playing? Well, first of all, it's not easy. Uh, uh, and um, most of the games, they fail. That's how it is. Like most starts up in general fail within the first year they're, they're gone. So it's a, it's a risky business. And this is part of why it's difficult to get financing for games. Uh, you have to build track records. And even if you fail, uh, that's a track record. <laughs> uh, because, uh, and, and as, this is true in, 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 for example, in Silicon Valley and many mature venture capital regions. Uh, if you have failed, uh, it, it's considered to be a good thing. Here in Iceland, if you failed, that's a bad thing. Uh, but it should be a good thing because you you have you at least have the experience. You know how to you know how things you know how to recognize things when everything goes down the toilet. You know the signs. Uh, but some become really really successful. Some of these games, uh, and for example, this one, crazy stuff, Tiny Wing. Have you played that? Nobody. That was highly successful. And I, I was trying to read about the story of this, this developer. This is an indie developer, and he made this game, and it went crazy. Tiny Wings. Tiny wings. Well, you have a slope, and you sort of uh, move. And uh, this was a total surprise to him. Uh, but it was a, uh, you know, and, and there are games in the App Store that have become really successful. But that's the problem. If you try to replicate the success, it's not guaranteed that it will work because things have changed. Now this is not the thing people are looking for. Everything changes so fast. So you can't use the marketing style that was used a few years ago. It doesn't work. Okay, it's a hit market. Uh, you can make it or not. So if you have a game concept, it doesn't work. Get over it. Go to the next one. Don't put more money into a failed game. That's the worst investment you can do. Six out of ten don't get, don't generate revenues to cover costs. Seven out of ten earned five thousand dollars or less on their most successful games. But there are lots of developers that are very successful uh, and make a decent amount of money. So this is uh, this is what we have to aim for. Here are some great sources to get information about these games, about how to uh, you know market, finance. So these are just great sources in general. Uh, and one of them, uh, I used that, the last one, uh, it's Peer Ninja app. Uh, it's, a, it's an app that you download. It has a checklist and everything on what you need to do to, uh, here are the tools you can use, here are the campaigns you can create. And they sell uh, campaigns and add-ons and stuff like this. But 
lots of great information in there. PR Ninja, you can download that. Um, okay, so I will go through some checklists, but before that, I want to emphasize uh, some ideas. Now, if you think about, so I, I'm imagining a game studio here. And if you think about, okay, how do we do marketing? Well, that's just, you know, we need to have a Facebook page and we need to have a blog, maybe. We need to do these things. Well, you have to think differently. Um, if you think about brands, this is a brand. Uh, you know, I, I picked some classic ones. And, and you know, the iPod, uh, this, is, this is a brand, Nike, Coke. Uh, but, but if you think about it, it's much more complicated than just logos. It's much more complicated. It's, it's, it's the whole system. It's the ecosystem. It's everything. So you have to think about brand as everything you do. So here's the, the idea. You think not about marketing as a separate function. Branding is done by this guy. No, it's everything. As an indie developer, you are the brand. Everything you do is making that brand. Because if you look at these brands here, for example, the iPod, everything the company Apple does is part of the brand. This is how it works. So you have to think about yourself as the brand. Everything you do, everything communicates. Everything you say, don't say, do, don't do. I took this from a friend of mine here. So if you have a blog, that's your brand. This is you. So you are marketing yourself. So you have to widen your opinion about marketing and branding. Everything you do, everything you say is a brand. So if you have a blog, you have a website, Facebook page, it has to be consistently to build, it has to be consistent to build up your brand. And this is how game studios should do. They should build this image, this brand, and think carefully about everything that they do. It has to be within this brand. Now, if you go back, uh, you know, the 20th century was sort of a century where you had these big broadcast publishing culture. And there was a reason for this. Uh, if we take publishing, for example, it was very difficult to get... Uh, you had to have a huge budget. For example, if you're a band, you needed a publisher to publish because there's no way you can fund going to a recording studio and then release an album and so on. So you had to get a publisher. Today you don't. Everything has changed. And uh, the 20th century was this sort of publishing, broadcasting, big supermarket kind of thing. You didn't go to the you know, butcher or the, the grocery shop on the corner where you knew everybody. That was, that was way back where you knew everybody. You went to the, the, the shop and you knew, knew the shop owner. And they would know exactly, if you, if you order something, they would know exactly how much of, of it. If you're ordering meat, they know your family. And if you forgot your wallet, you can pay next time. So this is sort of the pre-industrial thing, 20th century kind of environment. So. Uh, the 20th century was all about that, but all about the, the broadcasting, publishing culture. Uh, but then with the internet and social media, everything went back to this neighborhood kind of a style where you have these communication, the social, so the social networks, they sort of brought this communication back. So word of mouth has always been the strongest currency, and now we have a word of mouth on steroids. This is... Uh, the wine library guy, uh, who is an example of how to do marketing. Everything, is a, everything you do is the brand, and this guy is a brand by himself. Uh, so you have, now we have the means to go and communicate everything that we are doing. And marketing is like jazz. And this is from Peter, my, my friend also. Uh, so, so even if you learn marketing in school, then getting out there a few years later, everything has changed. Uh, it's a different world. And the old cases you read in school, maybe they don't apply. Maybe the management style of Jack Wells in the 90s or whenever he was the CEO, maybe they don't work today because you know, things are moving very fast. So you have to think about marketing as jazz. It's the same tune, but in a different variation. You have to change what you're doing. 
if it doesn't work, you have to change. And it becomes a conversation. It becomes a conversation. So you have to think about marketing as ongoing, all the time. Now, in the 20th century publishing culture, you would develop a game, then it was published. And then it's out. Today, it's not like that. You will start to market your game the day you start working on the game. You have to put it on the website, create a blog, talk about it, get people involved. You can play a beta version of the game or an alpha version. You can sign up for an alpha version. And you create videos, YouTube videos. You put it on YouTube, put it everywhere. Give everything away that you can, content. Get people involved and, and test things because this is the best way. You, you can actually get people to try. If they don't like it, well, you just saved a lot of money on finishing the game. And it's for free. <laughs> so you got this tripwire for free. So start the conversation very early. And then the toolbox, and I took this from this PR ninja. Uh, so you have to have you know, all the develop, developers things. So there are lots of tools, media relationships. So if you're an indie developer, you, you have to think about all of these things. So in this, there are some checklists in this, and, and then you can have to do campaigns. I will talk about this. So developers checklist, uh, concept art screen. This is your brand. You're building your brand here. Concept art screenshots, logos, icons, artistic quality, really nice. Uh, always the same one. Don't change it. Make it good and stick to it because it becomes... People see it once, they see it twice, and then again, and again, always the same. Soundtracks, uh, gameplay videos, teasers, trailers, content. Uh, one thing also, don't overdo it. Uh, it's like when, you know, uh, people, uh, you know, decide to go uh, and get into shape, they go to the gym. You know, they, they make a promise to themselves. I, I want to go to the gym now, and I want to get fit. And they, they will overdo it and stop in a few weeks because they overdo it. They, they were, it was way too much work, uh, and they couldn't keep up. So they stopped doing it. And that's the problem. Uh, but the strategy is to don't overdo it. Even if you have five blog posts you can post today, don't do it. Spread it. Then people get feeling, ah, these guys are active. They're always active. Ah, they're doing trailers. Ah, then a month later, there's a new trailer. So it doesn't come all at once, but it trickles out. It means that there's something going on. There's activity going on. Um, and website, email marketing service, that's a very important one. Um, and uh, some tools for social media. Uh, and then... Don't overdo the thi things like this. On, for example, Twitter. Don't put all the tweets in the beginning and then you give up. It has to be spread a little bit. LinkedIn actually is a very good tool. And you can hook up to other people in the industry. And, and uh, this is a very good if you need to ask somebody. And this is a community, the game development community, at least in Iceland. If you, if you have a question and you know this guy, I want to hook up with this guy, I want to ask him a question. Usually people uh, will answer. If they don't, it's not because they disrespect you. It's because they're probably busy doing other things. Uh, but it's, it's really uh, an open community. And then, of course, WordPress. But LinkedIn is something that you should definitely be on as a person. And then the PR and marketing checklist, press releases, they don't have to be complicated. If you post this to, if you build up a mailing list, you, so you find out who are the people of the newspapers, uh, and you get their emails, and you can send them uh, information, and maybe they will use it, and that's free advertisement. And I mean, these guys, they're fighting for, I mean, they, they need content to put into their papers, and, and anything is, if it's good stuff, they will, they will use it. Interviews, every opportunity have an interview. I mean, if, 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 I, mean you, I mean, maybe if you're too drunk or something, or, or, or have a bad cold or whatever, I mean, you might, might not do it. But you have to go into interviews, as many as you can. And also go to uh, any contests you can, industry events, always be there. You know, if you're an indie developer, you have to build the brand. And that means you show up. 
in person, always. You go to the meetups, you're there. An hour, that's not difficult. Talk to people, and, uh, and always, and, and, and also have giveaways, you know, stuff if you can. Uh, and then you have to do campaigns. Uh, campaigns, they're just simple steps of actions. So I'm gonna have campaign, pre-launch campaign, so I'm gonna, you know, and, and, you, and you document these steps, and you can get, you can, you can look this up. Uh, and you, it's just some simple steps you have to, and you execute this. Uh, so you define, what do I want to get out of this? Okay, I'm gonna increase the player base by these amount of players. So you, so you create these actions. So, uh, so let's do a trailer here, and let's then do this, and then that. So you, so you put down some action points of what you're gonna do. Then on Friday, we're gonna do this, and then the following week, we're gonna do something else, and then you execute this in a constantly careful, carefully planned way. And then the most important thing is to monitor. Is this working? How many views have we on YouTube now on a trailer? It didn't work, okay? And you go back. And this is building brand. This is how brands get built. So when people think about the game studio, the name, they think about all this brand universe that you have been creating. All the blog posts, the teaser video, everything. The logos, the games. This is the way the brain works. And uh, you should go to as much, many shows as you can. Nordic Game is probably the easiest, cheapest, best way for Icelanders to go. PAX East, the Lumox guys talked about PAX. They went there and found it to be very successful. And there are a bunch of these. Uh, uh, even if they are expensive, this is the priority you should have. So I think I'm done. This is, these are my thoughts on marketing. Are there any questions? I think that the, the time is you know, not too long. What about uh, using Kickstarter or, or Indiegogo as a... Market? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was, a, that was a, also... I had a slide on that. Uh, I'm not sure where, where it went. Uh, the question was, why don't you use Kickstarter? What was the other? Indiegogo. Indiegogo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure all of them apply for Icelandic people. You know, you, you can't... Uh, I think, uh, I think uh, uh, Kickstarter doesn't. Kickstarter doesn't. But, I, I, you know, that, that's one of the things that... Uh, yeah, like I said, I had, I had a slide on that. I uh, don't know where it went. But this is what I would recommend, you know. Use these programs. And it's actually a really nice scheme. So you have an idea. You tape a video of yourself explaining the idea. You have the concept art and everything. You put it out there. If it gets approved, uh, people sign up. I, I, I'm not sure if anybody ever knows how it works. So you need $3,000, $5,000 or something, whatever it is. And people will promise they will pay this, maybe for no good reason, otherwise then you get some free stuff. For example, I, I, I bought a book. Uh, it came out very recently. I bought a book, a friend of mine, he, he was writing a book, lives in the US. And I paid like $25, and I got a free copy of an ebook. And if I had paid you know, $1,000, um, I, I could have a, an, a, an hour on Skype with him talking about this stuff. Whatever it is, you know, whatever you want to have, but it doesn't have to be very much. And and they will pay for this, and then if you get five thousand, which is the goal, they will charge everybody of the amount. Kickstarter will, and they take tiny percentage of everything. Well, I don't know if it's tiny or, <laughs> but they will take a percentage. And this is how they operate, and then you have the money. Now, if it doesn't. If it doesn't, isn't successful, well, then you saved a lot of effort because this was maybe a bad idea and nobody liked it. Everybody hated it. And only your friends and family signed up just because they're loyal to you, not because they thought it was a good idea. But if you get people to fund it, strangers, uh, it's a good test. Is it a good idea or not? So crowdfunding is... And this is relatively new. And this, uh, I hope this will disrupt the financing and funding business. Uh, yeah. Any other questions? So, supposing that I'm some just starting up, starting up company for a game in Iceland, I guess I'm going to pay, and I need people to work for me. Where is the best place to find such people? 
Okay, okay so, so you have a game studio and you need to find people. Okay, well, that's a tough one. Uh, uh, one of the things that we were planning on doing in, in, uh, in the board IGI was to have this funnel, you know, requests like this into some way. But I, I think it's, uh, to answer this, I think it's just the problem with any company. You need uh, developers. But uh, for indie developers, small studios that are just starting, I would recommend go to the meetups, talk to people, uh, and have them join your project. And, and just present, take every opportunity, if you have a game concept, every opportunity to say, uh, this, is the, uh, this is the idea that I have and we're looking for people, uh, come join us. Uh, and I've seen many cases where that, this has happened, where people, whoa, this is a cool thing, I want to work on it. So use all the opportunity. But then, then, then the usual resources, uh, you know, uh, go to uh, advertising and things like that. If you want to hire people, that's a very known process. Uh, but if you want to get the passionate game developers, I would recommend just using the network and meetups. It looks like you want to say something. <laughs> uh, just basically here to <clears throat> answer questions as well. Okay. Uh, uh, to answer a bit, okay. is it, uh, it's muted? Microphones? No, it's, okay. Um, so to uh, add to his answer, uh, you can always also look towards school, schools, in terms of finding manpower. Because uh, usually that's the, uh, perhaps, uh, an easier way to find people because they are eager to get out to the market to join you and, and you know, work with a school on a project is also a possibility. But I want to add to this. It's not easy to do that. There is no, you know, you don't knock on the door of a school or university no. and say, hey, I need some developers, and they have to be really passionate about doing these type of game. There's nobody that will answer the door if you knock. Uh, but I just came to mind, uh, the computer science department has these final projects. And the final project is uh, you have to work for, so three, four students, they have to work on a project for whole term. And to connect this to the industry, what we do is we have the industry come up with projects. And they will get nothing out of it except they will probably have a chance to hire some of the developers. And, and, and they are eager to you know, give them work environment, give them computers to work on. And if they finish the project, they can keep the computers. So it's a really good incentive. And the reason why the companies want to do this is because they want to get developers. They want to hire students. And this is probably the best way. So if a game studio submits a proposal to the computer science department, it's on the website. I have a final project. It's about this concept here. But it has to be a finite concept. It has to be something that can have a start and finish and within the term. This is not your business. It has to be you know, a student project. So the companies have to honor that. Uh, but uh, they can't expect this to go in production and sale you know, right after the finish. It's not thought like that. But what you can have is you can say to the students, hey, this is a great job. I, we want to make you we want to make your job offer mm -hmm. because you have access to it. I know that uh, multimedia school has had these shows uh, where they display where where the uh, uh, the students at the school that are graduating uh, get like a show with a projector and everything to present their stuff basically and a lot of the these companies like uh, game companies or uh, advertising companies and such get to join in to watch them present them present their stuff and then contact uh, the creators of the stuff they really liked so that's one venue Any other question?
regarding your stock. Or any other question regarding IGI or, or uh, Game Creator? I think it's a wrap. I think it's a wrap. All right. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, like mentioned, this is the fourth and last workshop of Game Creator 2014. You have a week from now uh, to iterate the Sunday, the 16th of February at 23.59.59 is the last deadline. <clears throat> uh, and as mentioned, details on how to turn in a project will be available on Game Creator website, gamecreator.igi.is, and we'll probably post it on Facebook. If you're not following us on Facebook, uh, the Icelandic game industry uh, Facebook page, or the Icelandic or the uh, IGI community group, I strongly recommend that you do, because uh, a lot of the presentation that we have get promoted there, and a lot of interesting news, and you know local interesting news as well as uh, just inter interesting news. Uh, that's all for today. Thank you for coming, and uh, good luck. <laughs>